Hey, it's Sim. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm just going to kind of ramble about the last week that we spent in the Texas freeze of 2021 and kind of how we survived it and what happened to us. Um, and I'll also talk about what I read during this horrible week. Um, I just feel like before I get anything else done this week, before I can get back to writing or, you know, just getting my head back into that space, I need to like get this off my chest. And I figured some of you on YouTube might be interested in it. I mean, who isn't interested in a natural disaster story? Um, I obviously find them compelling. I wrote a book to part to part about my experiences during Hurricane Harvey. Um, and now we get to add another natural disaster trauma to the list of shit that happened to Houstonians in the last five years. Um, so I'm, I'm not even sure if I'm going to edit this. You're probably going to hear chainsaws going in the backyard round because a neighbor is like cutting down a tree that died. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll just do my best to be coherent. Um, so I'll just go through, you know, the timeline of what happened. So basically we knew that um, there was going to be a winter storm coming and my biggest concern was plants <laughs> at first, which seems really silly in retrospect. Um, but I did a lot of preparation for the plants, which was good. I didn't have to stock up on food and water because we living in Houston, I always keep like a week's worth of drinking water and non-perishable food on hand because we have so many floods, chemical explosions, boil water notices, hurricanes, like you just, I don't think it's safe to live here without that. So, um, and that was proven right again this week. And I'm planning on getting more disaster preparedness stuff because there's the chainsaws. Moving away from Houston is just not an option for our family. We've got like too many family members here that we have to be around. And my husband works for NASA. At some point, NASA will have to leave Houston because Johnson Space Center is at sea level and sea levels are going to rise and Johnson Space Center will be underwater. And I suppose at that point, we will finally relocate. Um, but until that happens, we're going to be Houstonians. So we need to prepare for the, the grid and society to fail at any given moment. So... Like I said, Saturday night, Saturday, Saturday morning, we knew that this storm was coming. We knew there was going to be like snow and a hard freeze. And like I said, I was worried about plants. So I'll put in pictures of like our plant preparations. We staked up, um, uh, first I had, we happened to have like five bags of oak leaf mulch, which just from the last time we blew our leaves, um, because we have an oak tree out back. So luckily we had five bags of oak leaf mulch and I think that that saved a lot of the plants. So I have been, um, digging up my yard all pandemic and planting native perennials weeds basically, um, because I'm slowly trying to transition my yard into like a native ecosystem, like a native prairie. I don't think I'm going about it like the best way, but, um, I planted like a bunch of uh, blue bonnets and prairie fire and fire wheels and um, all kinds of wildflowers that I love out front. So all I did to protect them was hump because they're still like short. I just humped oak leaves over the top of them and they all survived. They're all doing great. So oak leaves for the win. I also put the mulch really deep around the plants that we have in our garden bed. So we have two front garden beds, uh, lettuce herb garden, Oh, also, we had one strand of Christmas lights. Like, we're not, like, big on Christmas because we're Jews. <laughs> so, we put our strand of Christmas lights in that garden. And then around all three garden beds, we staked up a, a bed sheet and then a layer of plastic over the top. And luckily, we had... Um, we have a bunch of plastic that we've been reusing. I don't know. My husband got this plastic, like scrap plastic somewhere. And then we were able to use it for like painting the house earlier this year and like construction projects and having these giant sheets of plastic comes in super handy. And we do like reuse them all the time. We, um, you know, we've reused them for years. We're not like buying new giant sheets of plastic all the time. Obviously like we're environmentalists and we try to do zero waste. So like, um, if you can get your hands on some like scrap plastic, it's, super useful in situations like this. 
So everything was covered. Let's see. I also bagged the citrus tree in the front yard. Um, that all of its leaves are dead, but I'm hopeful that it will survive. Also humped um, leaves around its base. And then the jazz, the star jasmine that we have growing all along our back fence, I just humped mulch at the base of the plant and those all seem to be fine and the leaves are fine and everything. Those did great. So the vegetable garden did the best. It, um, uh, all the leaves, everything survived except for the basil, the basil, basil's finicky about cold. And, um, the, everything that was like buried under oak leaves completely survived, but the two front garden beds with some of the big shrubs where we had staked up the bed sheets and plastic, about half the plants there died without the Christmas lights. So with Christmas lights, everything but the basil survived without the Christmas lights. Um, we lost about 50% of the plants. So, Plants are obviously the least of our, I don't know why I got so on about plants, because those are obviously the least of our worries, but on Saturday night, that was the big worry. So Saturday, we prepared and like staked down on the plants. Saturday night, it froze. Sunday, we woke up and I was like, let me get the plants a little sun. So I kind of unstaked all the plants, let them get a little sun. And then we knew Sunday night was the night it was going to snow um, or ice or sleet. We didn't know kind of what yet. So... Sunday night, we restaked all the plants. It started coming down as, um, you know, first it was raining and then we started to get sleet. Um, and I could not sleep that night because I'm a Chicago kid and I loved snow. Winter was always my favorite, you know, time of year. So my niece and I, who's 14, like we stayed up until midnight. Um, and just kind of watching the rain turn into ice and being like, is it snow yet? Is it snow? And we started kind of seeing the ice accumulate. And then right around midnight, we got a couple flurries of like actual snow. And um, then the kid was like, all right, I'm, I'm ready to go to bed. And I tried to go to bed at that point and I just couldn't. I was really hopeful. I, I was excited. I was like excited for the fun. I wanted to be able to go sledding. I got the idea like if there's just enough snow to cover the grass, we can go sledding. I would just so wanted to go sledding. Like screw making a snowman, screw snow angels or snowball, but like I just love sledding. And we have a big hill at a park in our neighborhood. So luckily, like I knew I was like, we're going to go sledding there. So then Monday morning dawns, you know, and it's just fun and games. Like the kids, we get them all bundled up. We still had power at that point. And that was like the fun day. Like we were able to go sledding. We brought a Tupperware lid out to the hill and my, you know, Neef and I spent like, we first we went out with the whole family and we did like a little bit of sledding as a family. And then my three-year-old got cold. So we came back and then my Neef and I went back out and we were just like, Kids, I mean, we were just sledding for like maybe an hour, hour and a half. The only guy from the neighborhood who came out to the sledding hill was like this 60 year old dude from New York, of course. And he took a turn like going down the sled and then he was like, okay, I'm gonna go run home and get an inner tube. So he did that and we had been out there for like maybe an hour and a half at that point. And we were like, okay, I, I was like, as the adult, like I think we need to like go warm up. Um, so we did. And then by that point, the sun was up enough that it was still below freezing, but the sun was like melting away all the snow. And I was like, I think, I think that's it for sledding kid. Like, I think, I think it's all melted at this point. So, you know, then we're back in the house warming up. This is Monday afternoon. And we start to hear that a lot of our friends, you know, we're starting to check in on social media and hearing like, oh my gosh, like a lot of our friends don't have uh, power and the water starts trickling out of our faucets. We knew that our pipes were not burst. We had had, we had wrapped them really good and we hadn't lost power. So I wasn't worried that our pipes had burst, but like all of a sudden the water pressure drops and we're hearing, oh, the water pressure is dropping from the city. Um, and then by, I guess, was it Monday? Yeah, it was Monday. So we hear from my brother and my friend Sajani that the power is off in their apartments and they also don't have stocked up on drinking water and don't have stocked up on non-perishable foods and they both live alone so they're both like alone in their apartments without those things so I guess we heard from Sajani first and we were like well maybe you should come over like maybe you should drive over before um I can't remember if this was Monday or Tuesday honestly the days all blur together but we were like maybe you should 
Oh yeah, it was Tuesday. It was Tuesday. Sorry. So that night we went to bed and the next morning we wake up and that's when we started hearing from uh, like our friends and family, like we're out of power. It's getting really cold. We don't have drinking water. Like what do we do? So we took in our friend Sanjini first. We were like, come over. Uh, cause she didn't have any bottled water. None of the stores in her area were open to buy bottled water. And I was like, while the sun is up and it's safe to drive on the roads, like you should come over. And I was honestly really excited because we haven't had a friend over like all pandemic. We've been keeping it very tight, super doing the pandemic, like quarantine stuff. Um, so it was like, well, this is a natural disaster though. We have to take our friend in. Like she doesn't have bottled water, obviously. Like excuse to have a sleepover with a friend for the first time in a year. So I was pretty excited about that. Um, so Sajini drove over and then shortly after that, we got a call from my brother. Now my brother works at a, in a hospital, in an ER, x-raying COVID patients all day. Like he, this is his job is x-raying COVID lungs. He's an x-ray tech in an ER. So it's mostly, he's just x-raying COVID patients all day. And so we were super worried about his, like, so, so my husband and I are now vaccinated, but the kids are not vaccinated and Sajini's not vaccinated. So I was like, well, Sajini's already here. You need a place to go that has power, but you're exposed to all this COVID. So our niece has a bedroom in like the front of the house and he was cool with like, I'll stay there and I won't, you know, come out of the bedroom except if I have to go to the bathroom and then I'll wear a mask. And I was, and I checked with everybody, like, is everybody cool with this situation? And they were. So then my brother, Justin came over also. Um, so we were able to like cook for him and I really love like cooking for people. And so I was, it was nice to be able to like cook for my brother. We've only hung out like outside, um, you know, since the pandemic started and it was really hard having him in the house and him having to stay separate. Like if Sajini hadn't been there, honestly, I would have like, I just really wanted to give my brother a hug, you know, and I really wanted to like, I knew he could hear us like talking and joking and he was like alone in the front of the house and it was just like super sad. Um, these like compounding, stacking natural disasters, which of course are all related to climate change. So anyways, um, but so we had Sajini staying here and we had Justin staying in the front in the kids room. Um, Lane and or my niece and Sajini were sleeping on the couch and my husband and baby and I, my three-year-old and I were all sleeping in um, like one bed to stay warm. And that was, so that was Tuesday night. Everyone was here. We had just cooked. Um, my husband cooked some kimchi jjigae for everybody, which is like um, Korean, like spicy Korean soup made with kimchi. And it was delicious. And then around... Oh my gosh, so I can't believe I forgot to mention this part. So we had actually gotten a generator before all this started from um, my husband's stepdad. And then that night, at, well, while we were eating, or we were like just sitting down to eat the kimchi jjigae, and my husband got a call from his dad, his biological, his, his dad dad, not his stepdad, who lives down in Lamarck an hour away that their power had gone out and he's on an oxygen machine and is in hospice. And so he needs the oxygen machine to keep him alive and he didn't have power to charge it. And so he had to drive and it was like about to start freezing raining again. And it was unclear whether he'd have time to get down to Lamarck and back before the freezing rain started. And it was like, but also there was like no question. Like he, had to go bring his dad this generator. But it was just like terrifying and a terrible time. And I was like on the edge of my seat the whole time that he was gone, um, just worried about him. And luckily he was able to get the generator there and it kept his dad alive. I don't know what we would have done if, I guess we would have had to go get his dad and also bring his dad over to our house, which would not have been easy. Cause like I said, his dad is in hospice and like has a lot of medical equipment there. Um, that would have been really hard to accommodate. So I, I can't believe with like all the stuff that happened this week, like I also forgot that like major, major thing that happened that was super scary. 10 o'clock at night, the power went out. So we brought all these people here because we still had power, but the power went out. But they were all so glad to be with us. So immediately I like 
pulled out. I don't know why I thought it wasn't going to happen to us. I just thought, you know, I don't know. We're here in East End. We're near the chemical refineries and the power plants. And I thought maybe this is the one good thing about living near so much petrochemical industry is we won't lose power, but we sure did. So we lost power Tuesday night. I immediately like pulled out all the flashlights I could find and um, some of our camping gear. And luckily I, my husband from, he used to be in the military a lifetime ago. And he had all these like thermal military grade, like this thermal long winter underwear um, that's super, super warm when you put it on under your skin. And I would definitely recommend like anyone who's needing a survival kit to pick up some of those from an army surplus store. So um, yeah, you put them like underneath long pajamas and they, they really help keep you warm. And he had enough pairs in there for everybody to wear one, except for the three-year-old. So we all got thermal underwear on and, you know, went to bed, piled on the blankets and sleeping bags. Um, we got a little bit of power back for a few hours overnight, so it wasn't too cold by morning. But then Wednesday was the day we didn't have any power and it got real cold. <laughs> you know, it got to where our breath was fogging up in the house and we didn't know when power was going to come back on. And at this point, we were in touch with our friends from all over the city, all over the state. And we had heard like a lot of people were without power, but then the really scary thing that happened on Wednesday was like mid morning, we lost even cell reception. So no one could get any messages out on our phones. We couldn't even text anyone to see if they were okay. We were just like alone in our house, wondering if the, if, and when the power was going to go on, wondering if, and when the pipes are going to freeze. Um, we knew at this point that the whole city was under a boil water notice. And so we weren't using any water from the faucets to drink. Um, and it was just, you know, we were trying to keep it fun for the kids. I set up a tent. Um, my, actually my old literary agent had sent me the suggestion of setting up a tent inside the house. So I set up a tent in our bedroom behind me here with an air mattress in it. And we would like pile in there with the two dogs cause Sajji has a dog too. You know, with three people in there and two dogs hanging out in there for like about an hour, it got to be about 15 degrees warmer probably inside the tent than in the rest of the house. So we would kind of take turns inside the tent. Um, another reason that day got so dark was like my daughter had been eating junk food for four days because of, you know, everything going on. Even though we had had power, we'd been kind of eating more junk food than usual and more snacks than usual because of just feeling overwhelmed by everything and all the preparations and everything. We hadn't cooked too much like good food. We hadn't really been paying attention to what she was eating and she was eating a lot of junk food. So she got super constipated, like the worst constipation she's ever had. And she was like sitting on her potty for hours, like crying about the poop won't come out. And I was just like sitting there with her, like holding her hand, like baby, it's gonna be okay. And like made her, you know, some Miralax and apple juice. <laughs> that's not going to work for a week or two. Like, what are we going to do? Um, you know, and finally after just hours, she finally pooped, but she was like screaming and crying all day long. So we were cold. I was like wrapping a blanket around her and the potty to try to keep her warm. We had no means of communicating with anyone else. And here my like baby girl was like suffering so much physically. Um, it was a really bad time. And so then that finally, you know, uh, it was like getting dark. So it was like 4.30 PM and my husband is a ham radio enthusiast. So he had his ham radio out and there was a press press conference with Lena Hidalgo. And so that was sort of the first news that we'd been able to get all day. And she came out and said like, you know, at this point, this isn't just an emergency. This is a disaster and started talking about the people who had frozen and the people who had died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And I just started crying because I was like, I don't know how any of my friends are doing. I'm so worried about everyone in my city. I'm so worried about everyone in my state. Um, it was just a really scary time. Um, and definitely didn't foresee this event being as serious as like a hurricane, but it for sure was. Um, and luckily though, so then like my husband, my brother went to bed, um, late Wednesday night and then, but me and Sajji and Lane, my niece stayed up talking, um, 
and around like 10, 10 30 PM, the power came back on and we all just like hugged and <laughs> cried and we're like, Oh my God, it's back. And, um, hopped on zoom. We have a weekly zoom trivia thing that I do with some of my, one of my friends who moved to Maine. We've been doing it all pandemic. So we like hopped on the zoom and we're like, Oh my God, like other people. And we were like checking our phones and checking in with everybody. Cause we find, we got cell reception again as well. And we got Wi-Fi back. Um, and like, I remember feeling like feverish almost like as the heat in the house came up, like all my skin got tingly and like from, I hadn't realized how cold I had gotten, um, that day. Just, we were without power for about 36 hours, which was way less than some people. I have friends who were without power for like three, five days, um, with, you know, below freezing temperatures most of the time. Or no, we had lost, well, yeah, I don't know when we lost it. I think we lost it for about 36 hours. We lost it earlier the night before, I think. Like more around dinner, right after dinner time. So it came back on late and we were like making food, like microwave food, like just to be able to eat hot food really quick and stuff. Thursday was my birthday. We had power back, but we still didn't have water. And I was like, all I want for my birthday is to shower. I hadn't showered, I think, since Saturday. <laughs> and it was Thursday. We were all discussing because we lost water pressure like pretty early on. And the city was begging us like, don't use your water. Don't, you know, please. We need it for the fire hoses. So we had been respecting that and no one had bathed in like five days. <laughs> so we smelled so bad. Oh, my God. And I had also started my period like it was like it was I was nasty. So my husband and everybody else was like, uh, you definitely for your birthday can take a shower. <laughs> like, I think it's okay. We will all not use water all day. So you can take a shower. Um, so I got to take a shower on Thursday and that was pretty glorious. And I felt a lot better after that. My husband gave me a set of, um, we've been rewatching the next generation, uh, with my niece cause they obviously never saw it before. And, um, we all love Picard, you know? And so my husband got me a set and I also, I'm a big tea drinker. Mm. I should have put my tea in one for this video, but my husband got me a set of like Picard's teacups from the next generation. And they're like vintage. It's a great gift because I hate newly manufactured things. The whole like zero waste environmentalist. So, but it's vintage. These were like used teacups from the 90s. They were like a 90s, you know, Star Trek set of cups. And um, with a friend, they come with a French press. So they were not newly manufactured. They were like a vintage thing. It was like super up my alley. They're like actually really cute. And I swear that tea and coffee like taste better out of these cups. Um, so I just, I'm going to have to be careful that the three-year-old doesn't break them. Because she's like a super super breaker of plates and cups and cutlery and things. So I think we're only going to break them out for like special occasions. Um, so yeah, I ended up having like a pretty good birthday. I think that day my husband was like felt safe to go out and get supplies. So he went out and got some more food and drinking water and, um, like little cupcakes for me for my birthday. Cause we didn't, we didn't feel like it was okay to use the oven. They were still saying to conserve power at that point. So we didn't, we didn't, I, vetoed the idea of baking me a cake. Um, but we got one from the grocery store and then, uh, yeah, all in all, like just being able to have power back and take a shower kind of made it an amazing birthday. And also like being able to have my friend Sajani there when like all pandemic, I haven't been able to be with any of my friends, like in my house. Um, it was kind of a special time and it was just very feeling very grateful for the little things. And then, um, let's see. So then Friday and Saturday, uh, you know, the city's kind of getting back to normal. Most people have power and water. And I was like, I need to go volunteer. Like, this is what you do in Houston. I don't know. I have to volunteer. I just wanted to go volunteer. And my niece really wanted to come with me. Um, and that was super cool. And my spouse would have wanted to come too, but he had to stay behind with the baby. So we went, um, there was a food and water drive on Friday at, in Second Ward um, through Say Her Name, Texas. And so we, I was able to raise like, or like $700 that day on Twitter for supplies for that food drive. 
So thanks to all of you on Twitter who donated. That was amazing. And then the second day, Saturday, there was a joint food drive with DSA and Say Her Name and um, at, uh, at an apartment complex in Cashmere Gardens. So we kind of did the same thing. Went shopping, got donations on Twitter, went shopping, got a bunch of supplies and like stayed and volunteered at the food drive. Um, so doing those two things, you know, just kind of made me feel better. Like after days of sitting powerless, freezing, worried about your family and friends and neighbors, like being able to go out and actually help is very empowering and very good. And I think that that really is a testament to like the spirit of Houstonians. Like we, we always do help each other out after these disasters that continually befall us. And then that brings us to yesterday. Yesterday was Sunday. There was another drive um, with those organizations, but I, I kind of had to recognize like, okay, I need a day to rest. My husband is on console at Mission Control for the next seven days. So he's working like 10, 12 hours a day going into NASA, not like being at home, not like being able to work from home. Um, and like, he's going to be working these super long days, like through the weekend um, which means like all of the childcare and housework and everything is going to be on me for the next seven days. So I was just like, you know what? I need to rest on Sunday. So yesterday I just kind of let myself, what did I even do? I don't know. I think I sat around a lot on my phone and just, just like rested, <laughs> um, watched a lot of TV and just, just kind of chilled out. Oh yeah. Oh, we had friends over. Oh, that's right. My daughter hasn't seen her little friend, like our one sort of pandemic friend. We like, um, let the girls play together outside in masks and, um, she came over. So they played together all morning. She's super missed her friend cause she hadn't seen her in like two weeks at this point. And, um, that was great. And then we decided that since Sajini has already come in our bubble and Sajini like lives alone and works from home and is like just completely alone all the time. We were like, just stay, just stay in our bubble, Sajini. So she came over for dinner and that was great. Um, and we're going to keep, you know, we're going to keep doing that since we've, we've already swapped germs and we're both like, we're all like being super safe. So, um, why not at this point? Um, and yeah. So, oh, and then I was going to tell you what I read. So I did like promise to only read books by black authors in February, but I did break that promise during this week because I was just feeling like I need something completely escapist and, um, comic book form. <laughs> and, uh, my niece has been really wanting me to read these adventure zone comics. Um, they're obsessed with this. It's a podcast that got turned into a graphic novel or there's three, there's three graphic novels like catching up with this podcast that they've been listening to for years and they don't have any IRL friends who are interested in this series franchise at all. And, um, I just think it's really great if you have kids, like it's such an easy tip to like have a good relationship with your kids is to get into whatever they're into like it doesn't matter my three-year-old is into true in the magic kingdom which is like or true in the rainbow kingdom and like I don't know like so many parents I think just like think it's like cool or it makes them smart to like look down on what their kids are into and you're just sabotaging your relationship with your children by doing that and like, it's so easy, especially with teenagers, like their interests are so important to them and just like get into whatever they're into. Um, so I was like, you know, I'm going to read this. Oh, like, Hey Lane, can I read those adventure zone comics? And they were like, Oh my God. Yes. Let me get it for you right now. Oh my God. You're going to love it. Like they were so excited that I wanted to, um, to get into it like with them. So that's what I read this week. There's three of these graphic novels. This is the third one. I read the first two and I'm like in the middle of this one. Um, and they're great. They're super fun. So it's like a D and D podcast. Um, but I guess like voice actors, like I haven't actually listened to any of the podcasts, but, um, it's been going on for years and they're, they're, they play D and D together. It's these four, uh, three brothers and their dad and they're like comedians and they, they play Dungeons and Dragons together. And then the, and the writing for the, the campaigns is really good. And then they, there's an artist, Carrie Peach, who has turned, uh, the, the stories that they did on their podcast into graphic novels. So, um, so yeah, we just like, uh, 
it, these were super fun. They're just like super fun light reads. And now that all that is over, I'm gonna get back into reading War Girls. I gotta finish War Girls this week because that is the pick for the Climate Fiction Book Club, um, which the live stream for that will be happening on Sage Reads channel next Sunday, barring any natural disasters for all of us. Um, and so yeah, I'll be back into reading that this week and I'm hoping to also finish one more book by the end of the month. I want to try to finish Parable of the Talents by Octavia Butler since I read Parable of the Sower last month. So we'll see if I get to that. I also, I've read a bunch of um, uh, graphic novels by black authors that I got from the library this month, but the ones, I had already read all the ones that I'd gotten from the library and I'm still like waiting on a bunch more that haven't come in. Um, so we'll see if they do come in. Um, yeah, I have like a plan to do a picture, like, um, Black History Month picture book haul this week, but unfortunately this whole thing happened and now those books, those books were due, um, to the library. So I guess I can try to make it with like images, but I don't have the books anymore. I had to return them. So I don't, I don't know if I'm going to get around to making that, but I will, I will try. Um, but yeah, this week has really taken it out on me. I haven't done any like writing since probably last Friday. Um, obviously I haven't made any videos in like two weeks. So this is just me kind of getting back into it. We survived again. Hopefully we'll survive whatever the next shit is. Climate change is very real. These types of events should radicalize you. Capitalism does not offer any realistic solutions to climate change. Uh, yeah. So that's what I have to say about that. And I hope that all of you had a much better week than I did and that you are safe and well and have all of the essential things that you need to survive. And I'll see you next time. Bye.